We're here today to celebrate the 50th anniversary of our first victory at the 24 Hours of Daytona. It seems like yesterday. It makes me feel really old <laughs> when you think about 50 years, but it's, it's like it happened yesterday. And I remember things very clearly back then. I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but here we are celebrating the 50 years. Was it special to win? Absolutely. Did I expect to win? Never. First of all, uh, we were going to run a car that had never been run before. We were going to run in a race that Porsche had never won with any kind of normal car. They'd won with the 917s, but not, not with uh, a 911. And quite frankly, we didn't know we were going to have a car till somewhere in the middle of January. Peter told me about 15 days before the race, I get need for you to go to New York and pick up this car. Then we had about a week and a half to do everything we needed to do to make it pass tech inspection. That's the way we did things. Well, Jack, without doubt, was the glue that held everything together. Peter always fancied himself as, a, as an engineer, and he would come up with some really great ideas and some really crazy ideas. It was Jack's job to interpret what Peter wanted and then put it onto the race car to make it work properly. It was a little bit short notice and after I looked at the field I said I think we're going to do pretty good and the fact that we were racing against an identical car was operated by Roger Penske made it special and that's all it takes to make a race is two cars. As far as I was concerned it was our car and his car. Peter had a lot of respect for Roger and to have a car that was equal to Roger's car was really important for Peter. I remember in the race when, when both cars were running, I was behind George, so we were just nose to tail. And George couldn't lose me, so he was halfway driving off the racetrack to see if I would follow. And I said, no, 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 you're not going to sucker me into that deal. So it was uh, really exciting for me to be able to race successfully against George Fulmer and, and Mark Donahue. Oh, the old flywheel story. <laughs> We, we were going to run the final race at Daytona for the 72 season. Peter wanted to put a new engine in it, so we ordered a new engine from the factory. And it came right at the last minute, so he said, don't worry about it, put it in, we're gonna run it. So we put it in, and in practice, the flywheel came off. I got to looking at it, and I figured out why the flywheel came off, um, because of some changes the factory made that they shouldn't have made. And when the new car came, the first thing I did was take the engine out of the car and take the flywheel off and redo it so that I knew it was going to stay on. So Peter immediately called Roger up and said, you know, Roger, we've, we found that the flywheel bolts were loose. And Roger said, well, thank you very much, thinking Peter was just, you know, messing with him. So they went to Daytona with it like it was, and their flywheel came off in practice. So we were kind of vindicated there. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I never envisioned that we had a chance to win that race. We just did the best we could do. We only spent 24 minutes in the pits in 24 hours in 73. And I have the list that shows the actual pit times. And it just was a perfect race. And if Penske's car had held together, they would have been very tough competition. Somewhere in that race at Daytona, Chris Economaki came to the pits when Hurley was driving and Peter was in there in the pits and he was interviewing him. He said, Peter, how come it is that you're changing tires every pit stop and the Ferraris are not? And Peter looked at him and he said, you know, if the Ferraris were going as fast as we are, they'd have to change tires too. So. <laughs> yeah, as soon as Roger's car had a problem and they knew it was going to be terminal, Norbert Singer and the whole entire uh, cadre from, from Porsche came down to our pits. We had built up a pretty sizable lead, and I remember a sign being held out that said, Singer says slow. And Peter came over the uh, radio and said, ignore that, keep doing what you're doing, you're doing fine. From a driver's standpoint, when you break that rhythm, you get into a rhythm in a race, when you suddenly have to slow down considerably, the rhythm gets off kilter. So it really changes the whole race for him. I let Singer put his sign up, and then I just told Hurley on the radio, just maintain your pace. You know, <laughs> that's all we had to do. 
and Daytona was the first race where we used a radio. There were several advantages to having the radio. Yeah, that was uh, revolutionary in, in our day. So in 1973, Bobby Allison had a red helmet and they had radio communication between the stock car guys and the guys in the pits. So Peter wanted to try that out. It really helped with the strategy when you're able to call into the pits and say, okay, I've got this, I've got this, I think I'm getting a flat tire. Because we didn't have telemetry back then, so we had the advantage of that race. I remember radioing the pits that a, a seagull had flown through the windshield at you know, 170 miles an hour. Well, it was like a wake-up call. The carcass didn't make it all the way into the cockpit, so half the bird was in the cockpit, half the bird was outside the cockpit. The windshield had started to, to crack a little bit, so I radioed that in, and I remember you know, Jack Atkinson saying, stay out as long as you can, and we'll try to find a replacement for the, for the windshield. I just told him to go find me a windshield, <laughs> and we let him keep going until they came back with one. I don't know who found it. I'm not even sure where it came from. Just I know it came out of a Porsche. If that had happened to a car that didn't have radio communication to the pits, it would have been a surprise entry into the pits, and people would be distracted. They didn't have enough time to, you know, to really research and find a windshield that would fit. So radio really helped us a lot. Now, you know, you, if your bird hits a windshield in your car, it doesn't usually break it. And it wasn't until that windshield got broken that I realized that Porsche had decided they didn't need as thick a windshield in the race car. It was thinner and much weaker. So we never ran that windshield again after Daytona, but we also always went to the racetrack with a windshield ready to put in. There's no college you can go to to learn to be a racer, not to be a driver, not to be a mechanic, not to be a crew chief. You just have to learn it by doing it. When you're in a 24-hour race, you have a, a window of 24 hours that are your playbook. When you start a race, your car is as good as humanly possible. The minute that car rolls off the grid, it starts to go downhill. If you don't adapt to those conditions, those ever-changing conditions, you're going to go backwards. I'm talking about you know, the track changes, temperatures change, tires change, the engine gets hot, the engine gets cold, and that, I think, is what Brumos did better than most. But I just know we fit, we work good, and we won races. Mm -hmm.